said, today we're talking about recent developments on employment and benefits laws for LGBTQ plus employees. As you might have expected, this is due mostly to the fact that the Supreme Court came out a week today with a big decision uh, saying that LGBTQ employees are explicitly protected under Title VII on the federal side. So we're going to be talking about that decision a lot, but before we get there, I just want to let you know I'm Teresa Resnick. As Kath said, I'm an associate in the Rochester office. I practice in labor and employment law. I'm going to be talking for the majority of the presentation, certainly the first half, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, DJ Nugent in Syracuse. He's a benefits attorney, and he's going to pick up with the ACA and some other benefits issues affecting um, LGBTQ, especially trans employees. So this is our overview for our presentation early this afternoon. I'm gonna start off with an introduction and just kind of give a glossary of terms so that when I say certain things, everybody's aware of what I'm talking about. We'll then turn explicitly to the Supreme Court's decision that, was, that came out last Monday. We'll talk about New York laws on gender identity, since I believe most attendees are either located in New York or do some business in New York. We'll talk about some common concepts when it comes to gender identity and sexual orientation, just questions that I get a lot, subjects like pronoun use, restrooms, what to do if you have client objections or religious objections to having an LGBTQ person in the workplace. And then we'll touch briefly upon gender dysphoria and the Americans with Disabilities and New York State Human Rights uh, Leave implications for that. Uh, to round out my part of the program, I'm gonna go through four example scenarios, how you would apply each of those concepts kind of in a real life sample uh, situation. And then I'm gonna turn it over to DJ, who's gonna talk about the adoption of the revised rule implementing the ACA section 1557. He'll talk about elimination of certain prior rule provisions, the relationship to the Supreme Court's decisions, and then again, New York specific protections. So that is where we're headed for the next hour. As Kathy said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box. I can't promise that we'll get to all of them, uh, but we will certainly do our best to get to at least some of them at the end of the presentation. So starting off with a glossary of terms, this is our introduction. And I'm just gonna define when we say LGBTQ+, what we mean by that. So um, a lesbian is a woman who is sexually and or romantically attracted to other women. Someone who is gay, most oftenly associated with men, but it broadly means a person who is sexually and or romantically attracted to people of the same gender. A person who's bisexual is someone who is sexually or romantically attracted to men and women. Someone who is transgender, which is a big term we're gonna be hearing about in the next hour, is someone whose gender identity does not correspond to the gender they were assigned at birth. Someone who's questioning is someone who's unsure about their orientation and or gender identity. And then the plus is meant to be inclusive of all gender identities and expressions. You may have seen a longer acronym that explicitly includes some of those other identities such as asexual, pansexual, et cetera. Sexual orientation, coming off our glossary of terms, it's the part of a person's identity related to whom they are sexually attractive. Someone who's cisgender, that's a term you might have heard, is someone who identifies with their birth gender or the gender they were assigned at birth. And then someone who's non-binary or gender non-conforming, and those are both terms I'm gonna use within the next couple of minutes, is someone who doesn't identify as male or female. They might identify as both, neither, or be non-gendered. Please note when we're talking about gender identity and sexual orientation that they are separate concepts. And when we're talking about which terms to use for different people, it's generally best to use the terms that they use for themselves, even if it's not the uh, way that you might think that term should be or is most commonly applied. If you're wondering where those definitions came from, and I know people do have different uh, views of what each of those terms mean, and there may be different definitions floating out there. Those definitions came from the Out Alliance here in Rochester, New York, and they very graciously allow me to use them in my presentations. If you'd like more clarity on this, this subject of what's the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation, there is this great graphic called the genderbred person, and it kind of goes through the difference between gender identity, gender expression, biological sex, and sexual orientation. I'm not gonna go through each of those uh, explicitly as it pertains to the graphic, but you will have the slides, and that's definitely something I encourage you to refer to. It does a nice job differentiating between each of those different expressions. 
So now that we have the, the lay of the land in terms of our glossary of terms and, and some of the different phrases we're going to be discussing, I'm going to turn now to the Supreme Court decisions. And, you know, I think in the media we hear Supreme Court decision and that's really not quite accurate in this case. There, there is one decision, but it's actually formulating the basis of three separate cases. So we're going to go through the three separate cases that the court heard kind of all at once and made one global decision that will, will generally apply to all of them. So the first one is the one the court actually issued the decision in. That's Bostock versus Clayton County. That's probably the one that you're going to hear this decision referred to as most commonly. Then there's Zarda versus Altitude Express. And then finally, EEOC versus R.G. Harris Funeral Homes Incorporated. Um, so each of those three uh, cases had different facts. They all went up to the Supreme Court and then the Supreme Court issued one global decision meant to cover all of them. So in Bostick versus Clayton County, these are the underlying facts that led to this case uh, being brought. Gerald Bostick worked for Clayton County, Georgia as a child welfare coordinator. In 2013, he began playing on a recreational softball league for gay men. County officials criticized his participation in the league, and one month after they found out he joined the league, he was terminated for, quote, conduct unbecoming of a county employee. So that was the Bostick case. And then he sued under Title VII, which is the federal law that protects employees from discrimination in employment on the federal side of things, saying that he had been discriminated against because of his sexual orientation. And then the, court, the case made its way up to the Supreme Court from there. The second case that we had facts on leading up to the Supreme Court is Zarda versus Altitude Express. This is actually one from New York State. Um, Zarda, Donald Zarda was a skydiving instructor working for Altitude Express on Long Island, New York. He disclosed his sexual orientation to women who were concerned about stra being strapped closely to him while he was skydiving with them. The company found out that he was disclosing this information about his sexual orientation. And in June 2010, Mr. Zarda was terminated for sharing inappropriate information about his personal life with a client of the business. Um, and again, very much like Mr. Bostick, he brought his case under Title VII and said he had been discriminated against for his sexual orientation. This next case is a little bit different. The first two cases were sexual orientation cases. This one's a gender identity case. And in this one, the EEOC was actually involved on behalf of the employee. So this one is EEOC versus RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes Incorporated. Amy Stevens uh, is our plaintiff in this case. She worked as a funeral director and embalmer at Harris Funeral Homes in Livonia, Michigan. Miss Stevens was assigned a male gender at birth. In 2014, after working for Harris as a male for several years, she told her employer in a letter that she would be coming to work as her authentic self, which meant wearing women's clothing or clothing stereotypically associated with women. Two weeks later, after the company received that letter, Miss Stevens was terminated because the funeral home felt that her gender identity would be upsetting to customers and that her gender identity was a violation of the owner of the funeral home's religious beliefs and overall religious mission. So very much like our first two plaintiffs, she brought this claim under Title VII, saying she had been discriminated against uh, on the basis of her sex or gender, um, and that this, this should be an illegal practice under the law. So the Supreme Court heard all three of those cases together, and it, in all three cases issued one opinion, which is titled Bostick. And the court held that Title VII protects gender identity and sexual orientation as connected to sex, which Title VII has long protected. So if you think about the things that, if you look at the statute of Title VII, it protects sex, religion, uh, race, et cetera. Um, the Supreme Court said, okay, gender identity and sexual orientation are very much connected to sex. They can't be separated from sex. And because Title VII protects sex, it then must necessarily protect employees' gender identities and sexual orientations. The court wrote, and it's, it's a very interesting, lengthy opinion from Justice Gorsuch. Um, he has a lot of very powerful language in there. It was a 6-3 decision by the justices. Um, but one quote that I think is good for our purposes is the court said, an employer who fired an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions that it would not have questioned in members of the opposite sex. 
sex plays a necessary and indisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids. So really here we saw the court coming out very firmly and saying, listen, sexual orientation, gender identity are inextricably connected, connected to sex because Title VII protects sex. It therefore must protect an individual's sexual orientation and gender identity as well. Impact of the decision, I think it's gonna be multi-fold actually, but the most basic uh, right that it gives employees that they didn't have before is that employees who believe they've been discriminated against, retaliated against, or harassed based on their sexual orientation or gender identity can now 100% for certain bring their claims in federal court for the first time. Um, just to give you a sense of what that means, I know in New York, and we're gonna talk about New York in a minute, We've had protections for gender identity, uh, at least explicitly for a year and a half, probably implicitly for longer than that. But now for the first time, if you're bringing a claim for sexual orientation discrimination or gender identity discrimination in New York or any other state that's already protected those, you can now bring that claim to federal court, which entitles the plaintiff uh, to additional penalties and exposes the employer to additional liability. So claims under Title VII, which these would now be, if successful, can involve back pay to the individual if their pay was reduced or if they were disciplined or terminated, compensatory damages for emotional distress and was vary based on the size of the employer and based on the level of emotional distress involved, whether the person sought therapy or other type of medical treatment and then punitive damages for particularly egregious cases of discrimination. Um, employees generally have 180 to 300 calendar days after the last act of discrimination to file a charge with the EEOC. Uh, keep in mind those have to be filed with the EEOC before you can go to federal court. But, but generally speaking, we're talking about now employees have rights that they did not have before and they have them explicitly. They can now go to federal court to sue their employers when they believe that they've been discriminated against. That's a right that they did not have before. One other impact of this, I think, you know, the fact that we're talking about it right now, the fact that it's been so highly publicized, even in states like New York, where employees had these rights for a little bit of time, at least already, they may not have known that they did. Now with this case being on the national news, the local news, the international news, employees are going to start knowing that they have these new rights and, and going to correspondingly, I think we'll see an uptick in cases relating to gender identity and sexual orientation in the federal courts um, in New York and in everywhere else as well. Simply put, people who didn't know they had these rights now and didn't have those rights before know that they do. So that takes me nicely to New York laws on gender identity. As I alluded to, New York has had protections for gender identity for some time already. That mostly came by way of the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, or GENDA. It amended the human rights law in 2019 by adding gender identity or expression as a protected category. And the law, the actual New York state law, defines gender identity or expression as a person's actual perceived gender-related identity, appearance, behavior, expression, or other gender-related characteristic, regardless of the sex assigned to that person at birth, including but not limited to the status of being transgender. So basically, gender and its addition to the New York Human Rights Law protects the way a person expresses gender through speech, dress, behavior, and other outward actions. Another part of the New York state law that explicitly encompasses gender identity and sexual orientation is the sexual harassment law. Everyone uh, with employees in New York is well aware that last year, New York passed enhanced sexual harassment training requirements and policy requirements. One of those explicitly included gender stereotyping as a type of illegal sexual harassment and gender stereotyping occurs when personality traits are considered inappropriate because they don't conform to other people's ideas or perceptions about how individuals of either gender should look or act. So we see that generally when it's things like looks, speech, personality, or lifestyle. You know, for example, that's not the way women wear their hair, a real man wouldn't talk like that, um, or performing a job that is usually performed or was performed in the past by persons of the opposite sex. 
Uh, for example, men can't be nurses, women can't be supervisors. Those types of things are all what we would classify as gender stereotyping. And at least in New York, gender stereotyping is considered to be a type of illegal sexual harassment. Now, while I'm on New York and I'm thinking about the federal law, I will say when it comes to harassment, New York and the federal government do have different standards for what harassment can be. New York, if you remember, changed its standard from the more commonly severe or pervasive standard to petty slight or trivial inconvenience. Anything that rises above either of those qualifies as harassment and certainly would qualify as sexual harassment. Um, so gender stereotyping would qualify as sexual harassment in New York if it rose above a petty slight or trivial inconvenience. At the federal level, gender stereotyping would become a violation of Title VII if it rose to the level of severe and pervasive, which is a higher standard that would have to be met. Not saying that it can't be, I think it certainly could be, especially after the Supreme Court's decision. Okay, so common concepts I'm going to be talking about, uh, just some of the things I mentioned in the beginning that I tend to get questions on a lot, some of the more practical issues. Um, and the first one is going to be pronoun use. I get a lot of questions about which pronouns to use, when to use which pronouns, what the penalties are for not using correct pronouns. Um, but bottom line, failure to use correct pronouns for individuals in the workplace is discrimination. Correct pronouns can vary. There's a list of correct pronouns online if you look it up. I think we're, we're well into the teens, if not 20s, of the list of correct pronouns. But some of the more common ones can include they, them, he, him, she, her, or z, them. It is illegal under New York City and New York State human rights law to use the incorrect pronouns for people in the workplace. Um, and under Title VII, if the incorrect pronoun usage amounts to the level of severe and pervasive harassment, that's going to be illegal under Title VII as well. Just to give you a sense of what the penalties attached to that can be in New York City, violators or employers who allow um, their employees to use the incorrect pronouns for people are subject to civil penalties of up to $125,000 and up to $250,000 if the penalty is considered, uh, or excuse me, if the violation is considered to be willful. So when all that is to say, when you're talking about pronouns and correct pronouns to use in the workplace, it's important to educate employees about the importance of correct pronouns and impose consequences for violations. I've said it again, I've said it, I'll say it again, a policy is only ever as good as the enforcement behind it. If you have a rule or policy saying that everyone needs to be addressed by their correct pronouns, that certainly is something that needs to be enforced in the workplace. Turning now to restrooms, this is probably the most common question I get is what are we supposed to do about the bathroom if we have someone with a different or non-stereotypical gender identity in the workplace um, and we have other employees who are saying they feel unsafe in the bathroom or you know, what are we supposed to do about the bathroom? So one thing I'll note before I turn into the New York and federal laws on it is I'm gonna talk about OSHA for a second, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. OSHA in 2015 decided to issue uh, an informal guidance memo about using the restroom in accordance with someone's gender identity. And they did that using their sanitation standard. And in using that standard, their guidance explicitly favors allowing employees to use the restroom consistent with their gender identity, as a failure to do so could become a workplace safety concern under that sanitation standard. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, look up the OSHA guidance. It's, it's widely available online or OSHA's website. It's got some really interesting and well thought out language in there about restroom usage and, and people with different gender identities. Turning to New York, New York City human rights law, employers must allow employees to use the restroom of their choice. Please note that that very likely means the group restroom of their choice. It is not generally sufficient to, to say, you know, here's the personal one use restroom and all people who are trans or gender non-conforming must use that restroom. It generally means that you have to allow that person to use the group restroom, if you have one, of the gender that they identify with. Under federal law, the Supreme Court decision explicitly says that it is silent on the impact of its decision on restrooms. So there's a line in the decision where Justice Gorsuch says, I know 
everyone's going to want to interpret our decision to have to do with restrooms and locker rooms and all types of other things. That's not really what we're addressing today. That being said, um, given the Supreme Court's decision, very similar to what I just said with pronouns, it's likely that a harassment claim could result if a workplace doesn't allow restroom usage consistent with an employee's gender identity. If a court would look at that and say that's severe and pervasive, that's harassment, that's an adverse employment condition, or anything of the like, then that could be actionable under Title VII. And certainly I think it's something that an employee or a plaintiff's attorney would be willing to try in the wake of the Bostick decision. Okay. Client objections. So if you remember when I was going over the uh, different factual scenarios that led those three cases to be brought up to the Supreme Court, you'll note that all of the employers who went before the Supreme Court argued that their customers felt uncomfortable or that their public image was affected by their employees' gender or sexual orientation. So each of those employers in defending why they took the actions they took against those employees they said, well, our customers would be uncomfortable, it affects our public image in the community, and they use justifications like that. The Supreme Court did not consider those to be sufficient justifications, and neither should any of you. Uh, presumed or actual customer or public prejudices are not sufficient bases to justify violations of Title VII or the New York City human rights law for that matter. Loss of business or loss of quote unquote public perception are not defenses to an employer's discriminatory actions, either under Title VII or under New York state law. Religious objections, kind of a similar situation. The New York State and New York City human rights law, as well as Title VII, all prevent discrimination on the basis of an employee's religion. We know that. Religion is one of our protected categories, both under federal and state law. It has been for a long time. So you can't discriminate against an employee because of their religious beliefs or religious practices. But at the same time, especially in the wake of the Bostick decision, an employer's actual or perceived religious objections do not justify discrimination. They do not justify breaking the law, and nor do they allow uh, letting a coworker do the same. It's not a violation of an employee's religious rights in the workplace to require an employee to follow the law. And if that's a little confusing, it can sometimes be helpful to take it out of the religious concept and think about it with another protected category. For example, if someone said, my religion doesn't allow me to work with someone because of their race, or doesn't allow me to share a bathroom with someone because of their race, that's all something that everybody on this webinar would know immediately. That is not a sufficient reason uh, to allow that employee to discriminate or to allow the company to dis discriminate. It's the same thing with gender identity and sexual orientation. Those are protected categories in the same way that race is, in the same way that religion is. It is not a, uh, an accommodation or uh, discrimination to allow one of your employees to break the law. I will note here for religious institutions, Title VII works differently. So if you're a religious institution or a church um, and you're listening to this, please uh, just be aware that Title VII doesn't apply. Uh, to employees in ministerial positions and that there are other implications to the way Title VII works and other labor and employment uh, laws work for that matter when it comes to religious employers um, and religious organizations. For those of you that are listening and are religious institutions or organizations, the Supreme Court is going to come out with a decision very soon for all of you as well um, on what the definition of a ministerial position is. So please stay tuned for that. We should have that any day. Finally, um, before I turn to practical tips and some examples, I'll talk about gender dysphoria because sometimes I get questions about is someone who is transgender or non-conforming, do they have a disability? Uh, that is a matter of some debate uh, within the LGBTQ plus community and, and within the courts as well. But gender dysphoria is recognized as a psychiatric illness uh, by both the American Psychiatric Association and by uh, New York State. So gender dysphoria is, defined, dysphoria is defined as a conflict between a person's physical or assigned gender and the gender with which they identify. This may cause significant distress and or problems functioning per the APA. Again, this is a somewhat controversial term as many non-binary and transgender people do not believe that they have a psychological illness. 
That being said, in 2017, a federal court in Pennsylvania held that gender dysphoria could be a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act because of its associated physical symptoms. Um, so in all the, the interactive process that would come along with that would apply. And then New York and New York City human rights laws also view gender dysphoria as a disability and require reasonable accommodations from employers when an employee says, I have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. So just keep that in mind. It's um, related to what we're talking about. It's not exactly the same thing, uh, but certainly if you have an employee saying, I have gender dysphoria, I've been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, you have obligations under the state law and probably under the federal law too, to reasonably accommodate that employee to the extent it doesn't cause an undue hardship to you as the employer. So some practical tips. Uh, this is surprising to absolutely no one, but please review your handbook policies. Make sure your equal employment opportunity policy explicitly protects sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. That your sexual harassment policy also protects the same. Look at your dress code and grooming policies, please. A lot of times those are segregated by uh, stereotypical genders and gender stereotypes can be found within those. It's fine to have a dress code and grooming policy just or uniform policy, just please be careful about the way that you're having it apply to genders. And it's never a bad idea in that policy to say, if you feel that you cannot comply with this policy because of your gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other reason, come to human resources, go to your supervisor, whoever it might be, and ask for an accommodation or explain why you, know, you can't comply with this policy. Um, that's just generally good language to have in there, especially as what we would consider the social norms on what women should look like and what men should look like um, and vice versa are shifting. One other thing I'd urge you all to consider, especially in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision when your employees may have questions about what that means to their workplace and what that means for them, is creating a gender identity and sexual orientation non-discrimination policy in and of itself. When I do them, I address kind of the four most common questions that I just went over with all of you. What employees should do about pronouns, what they should do about uh, changing names in the workplace, what the employer is going to do about restrooms and customer objections, and you know what's considered harassment on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation, what the employer will do in terms of leave if someone needs leave, you know what the consequences are for violating the policy, all of that stuff, but tailored specifically to the gender identity and sexual orientation context. It doesn't need to be super long, but it does kind of clarify it in a way that most sexual harassment and equal employment opportunity policies don't. It, it just goes a little bit farther and is more explicit. Certainly, you're going to want to look into educating and training your supervisors and employees, uh, both on what their rights are and what your expectations are for them. You'll want to know which leave laws apply to gender rela identity related conditions. I mentioned the ADA and the New York Human Rights Law, which may allow leave as a reasonable accommodation for those diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Please also note that the FMLA may also allow leave for surgeries or hospitalizations or ongoing medical appointments. Certainly those are not things that apply to all people who are trans or have different gender identities, but um, it can apply to some of them and the FMLA leave may be available in those circumstances. Okay, I'm gonna go over some example scenarios and then turn it over to DJ to talk about the benefits side of things. So example one, Brianna has supervised the same group of people for 10 years. A few years ago, one of Brianna's team members, Adam, transitioned from female to male. Brianna calls Adam by the female pronoun repeatedly and Adam corrects Brianna each time. Three months after Adam's transition, Brianna is still using the incorrect pronoun and is still not correcting other employees to do the same. Is this illegal? Yes, this is our pronoun uh, usage. It goes along with what I was saying. You have to use the correct pronouns for people even if you used a different pronoun for them previously. Once someone has said, I go by this pronoun now, this, now this is the correct pronoun for me, that is the employer's obligation to say, okay, I'm going to call you by your correct pronoun and I'm going to mandate that all your coworkers do the same. So yes, this would be illegal, especially a significant amount of time after the employee requested use of a different pronoun and especially because 
it's coming from a supervisor, it very easily could rise to the level of harassment and discrimination under New York law, and it may also meet the level of severe and pervasive harassment under Title VII as well. Example number two, Sandra was hired by XYZ Company two months ago and has been using the women's restroom ever since. Recently, one of Sandra's coworkers learned from a mutual friend that Sandra is a transgender woman. This coworker refuses to use the women's bathroom with Sandra anymore and told HR that she feels unsafe doing so. She demands that the company stop Sandra from using the women's bathroom, saying that it's giving her stress and anxiety at work to share a restroom with Sandra. So a couple things going on here. Um, so what should the company do? The main answer, as I alluded to earlier, is that Sandra has to be allowed to use whatever restroom she wants, including the group restroom. For the employee who feels uncomfortable or quote unquote unsafe using the restroom with, with Sandra, there are a couple options. You can, you can try to accommodate that employee by allowing that employee to use a personal bathroom that, that is not a group restroom if you have one. Um, but generally speaking, it's not a reasonable accommodation to break the law. So even if this employee says, I'm having stress and anxiety, and they bring in a doctor's note saying, I can't use this restroom, it's not generally considered a reasonable accommodation or ever really considered a reasonable accommodation to uh, break the law, which is what it would be doing in this case if Sandra were to be barred from using the group restroom. So there's a couple of moving pieces in that when I kind of threw in the disability or potential disability um, as a real life scenario type piece. But and bottom line, end of the day, the main answer is that Sandra needs to be allowed to use the group female restroom. So example number three, Adam has been employed at XYZ Company for 10 years. He's devoutly religious. He's recently learned that one of his coworkers, Eve, identifies as a non-binary individual. Yesterday, Eve said to Adam, the pronouns that should be used for me are Z, Zem, or Zer. Adam refuses to use Eve's correct pronouns, and when HR tells him that he has to, he threatens to sue the company for religious discrimination. So what should XYZ Company do? Again, uh, very similar to the previous example with disabilities, it's never going to be a reasonable accommodation or an appropriate religious accommodation to allow Adam to break the law. Adam needs to use the correct pronouns for Eve, regardless of his religious beliefs. At least the employer can't discriminate against Adam for having those religious beliefs, but it's not discriminating against Adam to tell him that he must call Eve by Eve's correct pronouns. Um, so that's how that one would go. And then finally, example four, Jamie, an employee at XYZ Company, comes to Human Resources and says they are non-binary and that their correct pronouns are they, them, and theirs. In this meeting, Jamie also alludes to needing time off, but doesn't specify as to why. What are XYZ Company's obligations? Certainly, to now call Jamie by their correct pronouns, that's the main obligation. Uh, regarding the time off, if Jamie were to say, uh, you know, I have gender dysphoria and I need time off or I need time off for a medical appointment or a medical reason. Certainly that's uh, something that the employer could ask for documentation on. If Jamie has not stated explicitly why they need time off, uh, the employer really should only be asking Jamie why they need the time off if that's something that the employer would normally ask any other employee asking for a corresponding amount of time off. Don't just start asking your non-binary or trans or LGBT employees why they need time off if you don't ask that of other employees. All right, so that is my part of the presentation. I know I got some questions, so I will look at those while I turn it over to DJ to talk about benefits. Thanks, Teresa. Um, so, so my topic it covers a development that came out a few days before for the Supreme Court decision that Teresa just covered was issued, and that was President Trump's administration revising a rule that implements Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. So just to do a brief overview of where I'm going to go, I'll talk about the background of Section 1557 of the ACA and its implementing regulations that were issued in 2016. Um, just for purposes of clarity, I'll call that the 2016 rule. Then I'll talk about the overview of the provisions in this rule that was just issued um, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. I'm gonna call that the 2020 rule 
Uh, I'm going to discuss the relationship between the 2020 rule and Bostic that was just issued. I think we may be able to provide a little bit of clarity or explanation there. And then just very briefly touch on some New York State specific protections um, that apply regardless of federal action um, at this time. Uh, next slide, please, Teresa. So just some background on Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. This is a civil rights provision in the Affordable Care Act that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability in certain health programs or activities. This provision has been in effect since 2010, um, and the provision in the statute applied existing civil rights protections to certain areas of healthcare where they didn't or may not have applied previously. Um, some specific provisions outlined in the statute itself are Title VI, Title IX, and the Age Discrimination Act. Uh, Title VII and, uh, is not mentioned in the statute, and I just wanted to put that out there now because that'll have some relationship when we're talking about the Supreme Court decision uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So after Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, became effective. Uh, this was during President Obama's administration. Proposed regulations were issued and those regulations uh, became final in 2016 during President Obama's administration. So the 2016 rule addressed a variety of topics. It included a notice requirement and that required that covered entities notify their beneficiaries and enrollees and even members of the public that the covered entity did not discriminate on the basis of, of race, color, national origin, sex, uh, et cetera, just like I, I mentioned before. Um, it required forms of aid, like the notices had to inform those people that there's forms of aid and assistance services for individuals with disabilities and for individuals with limited English proficiency and how those individuals could obtain those services. And it also required those covered entities to post taglines. I'm sure some of you are aware of that requirement and at least 15 languages spoken by the limited English proficient populations in that covered entity state. Um, the 2016 rule also included specific provisions prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex. It, it included a blanket provision um, prohibiting discrimination and also several specific provisions. And, and I'll come back to that in more detail in a minute. 2016 rule required meaningful access for individuals with limited English proficiency similar to the notice requirements that I, I just mentioned. This would require language assistance services, translators, translation services, and it also restricted the use of certain individuals that could potentially interpret for individuals with limited English proficiency. And, and the point of that rule was if an individual came in to receive healthcare and they had a minor child with them, the covered entity could not require the minor child to be the interpreter. The covered entity essentially still had to provide some form of help to the person with limited English proficiency. Um, similar vein in communications, um, the 2016 rule required effective communication for individuals with disabilities. And that rule said that covered entities were required to take appropriate steps to ensure that communications with individuals with disabilities are as effective as communications with others in health programs and activities. Also, the 2016 rule did not include a blanket religious exemption. Um, there was a provision in the 2016 rule, I have it quoted here, that said, insofar as application of any requirement under this rule would violate applicable protections for religious freedom and conscience, such application would not be required. And that's talking about the application of the 2016 rules requirements. But there was no blanket statement of religious exemption in that 2016 rule. Uh, next slide, please. So just continuing on with what was in the 2016 rule, I wanted to dive into some specifics on the prohibitions on discrimination on the basis of sex. So the 2016 rule defined discrimination on the basis of sex to include gender identity and termination of pregnancy, and further defined gender identity as one's internal sense of gender, which may be male, female, neither, or a combination of male and female. This provision faced some blowback and some litigation ensued, and two federal courts ruled that 
HHS could not enforce this provision. Um, so Health and Human Services has not been able to implement or enforce this provision on gender identity and termination of pregnancy since December of 2016. Also, I'm sure you can tell by, by the timing, administration changes were coming. This rule was on, the, on President Trump's uh, radar. There was discussion that the rule was going to be changed, and then that's what, what ended up happening. So next slide, please, Teresa. So after President Trump's administration took over, um, there was proposed rules again, long comment process, and just recently, a 2020 rule was issued that significantly revises the 2016 rule, as well as several other related non-discrimination um, protection regulations. I'm just gonna hit on a few of the topics that the 2020 rule changed or revised and then get into some of those revisions in detail. So the 2020 rule first reduces the scope of entities that are subject to the 1557 regulations. It also eliminated the definition section in the 2016 rule. So phrases such as on the basis of sex and gender identity that had a specific definition in the previous version of the rule are no longer specifically defined in the 1557 rules. Um, the 2020 rule also eliminated the specific provision from the 2016 rule, which prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. And I, I'll get into that in, in detail a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, the 2020 rule generally eliminates the notice and tagline requirements, potentially some, some issues that may come up there, those may still apply. And the 2020 rule also includes a specific religious exemption. Um, the, 20, the 2020 rule does a few other things. I just wanted to hit on the, the hot button issues and I'll, I'll go into these in detail, but th this is not an exhaustive list of what the 2020 rule um, states and requires and what it means. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just, just to start on the reduction of scope, like I said, the definition section of the 1557 rules has been removed in the 2020 rule. Um, that definition section in the 2016 rule created broad applicability of the 1557 rules. So now with no definition section and no defined covered entity, the 2020 rule states that it applies to one, any health program or activity, any part of which receives federal financial assistance provided by Health and Human Services. This could take the form of credits, subsidies, or contracts of insurance, things along those lines. It also applies to any program or activity administered by HHS under Title I of the ACA, or any program or activity administered by any entity established under Title I of the uh, ACA. Some entities and programs the 2020 rule does not apply to are church plans, self-funded group plans, um, short-term plans, and accepted benefits plans. So the rules stemming from Section 1557 of the ACA, as embodied in this 2020 rule, do not apply to those entities or programs. Uh, next slide, please. Just continuing on with that reduction of scope topic, there's no specific definition of health programs or activities to which Section 1557 would apply to. Like I said before, that, that term was defined broadly in the 2016 rule. The 2020 rule does discuss what health programs or activities are, and the 2020 rule says those are healthcare entities. Healthcare entities, the 2020 rule says, are entities principally engaged in the business of providing healthcare that receive federal financial assistance. If an entity falls within that definition, 1557 and the 2020 rule will apply to the entire operation of that entity. There's also potential limited application of 1557 and the 1557 rules to non-healthcare entities that receive federal financial assistance, but only to extent that the 1557 rules only apply to the extent that those entities are subject to in receiving um, financial assistance. So if one avenue of the entity does not receive financial assistance, 1557 and its rules are not applicable to that part of the entity. So, uh, an interesting note in this regard is health insurers are not defined in the 2020 rule as healthcare entities. Therefore, the scope of the 2020 rule in 1557 
are, are limited, uh, even with regard to the non-discrimination protections for health insurance products. Um, so health insurance products that don't receive federal financial assistance, such as the sale of non-ACA products or services, um, or services as a third party administrator for a group health plan, they don't have to comply with 1557 and the 2020 uh, rules requirements. Uh, next slide, please. To get into the discrimination provisions in the 2020 rule, what, what's in the 2020 rule and what's not in the 2020 rule compared to the 2016 rule, the 2020 rule in, includes a, a general prohibition against discrimination based on, on those categories we've discussed, race, color, national origin, sex, disability, um, et cetera. That provision from 2016 is still in the 2020 rule. What's not in the 2020 rule are specific provisions that were in the 2016 rule discussing what was a pro prohibited form of discrimination on the basis of sex. So the 2016 rule had a few provisions discussing this, and it said that covered entities could not utilize criteria or method, methods of administration that had the effect of discriminating on the basis of sex, nor could covered entities in determining sites or locations of the facility, could a covered entity uh, make selections that would have the effect of subjecting individuals to discrimination under those applicable programs on the basis of sex. Those, those provisions, are gone. Also, the 2020 rule does not formally adopt a new definition of sex. So like I said, the 2016 rule defined what they, what they thought that term meant and how it was going to apply. The 2020 rule does not include those provisions. It does, in the preamble to the 2020 rule, indicate what the 2020 rule interprets sex to mean. And it interprets sex to mean biological sex, or, or in other words, your sex determined at birth. Uh, next slide, please, Teresa. So I, I'll just touch on this very briefly. The, the 2016 rule, as I said, did not include a blanket religious exemption. The 2020 rule does. And it states that Section 1557 will not apply if any part of the rule would violate depart from or contradict definitions, exemptions, affirmative rights, or protections under, under a wide range of federal civil rights laws and provider conscience um, provisions. So th this is a much broader exemption from the requirements of 1557 and its rules than the previous rule had provided. Uh, next slide, please. Notice and tagline requirements in the 2020 rule. Uh, like I said, most of you are probably aware of, of these requirements. The 2020 rule eliminates the 2016 rules notice and tagline requirements. Um, in the 2016 rule required covered entities to notify beneficiaries, applicants, and the public of that key information I discussed before. Um, it had to include that the entity did not discriminate on the bases provided by section 1557, uh, race, sex, color, those categories that appropriate aids and services such as interpreters and language assistance, such as translated documents would be available without charge and in a timely manner. And it also provided notice on how to file a complaint if those requirements were not met. Uh, un under the 2016 rule, covered entities were also required to include those taglines I explained before subject to those requirements. Those specific provisions, the notice and tagline requirements in the 2020 rule do not exist. So they've been removed from the 2016 rule. I, I do want to note that taglines may still need to be provided. So there are, there are other rules other than 1557, such as the rules discussing summaries of benefits and, and coverage. I, I think taglines are still going to need to be provided in those instances and also in several instances with other documents as well. Also, it needed to ensure meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals. I, I'm gonna get into this in a moment, but the 2020 rules still retain the requirements to provide meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals. And if the covered entity, I, I shouldn't use covered entity because that de definition is no longer in the 2020 rule, but if the applicable entity could satisfy that requirement by using taglines, they may need to use them. 
Uh, next slide, please, Tree. So I, I've gone over the elimination of protections and provisions in, from the 2016 rule to the 2020 rule. The 2020 rule still does provide protections under, under 1557. Um, to start, it, will, it states it will enforce all applicable laws and regulations that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, disability, age, and sex, according to the meaning of federal laws and based on civil rights regulations. It gets back to the, the lack of a definition section. They're not defining what phrases mean in the 1557 rules now, but they will enforce laws to the extent that they apply. Um, the 2020 rule also retains the 2016 rule, which protects individuals with disabilities by ensuring physical access for individuals with disabilities to healthcare facilities and appropriate communication technologies to assist persons who are visually or uh, hearing impaired. It also retains the 2016 rules qualifications for foreign language translators and interpreters for non-English speakers and its limitations on the use of minors and family members as translators or interpreters. This is what I, I discussed that requirement previously. In addition to that rule um, for foreign language translators, the 2020 rule adds a four-factor analysis to ensure that meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals are ensured while also securing flexibility to providers in meeting such obligation. So, so that's a, a four-factor test that should that gives flexibility and it's really a fact by fact scenario. Um, but that's where the potential to still use taglines would come in if under that four-factor test you could potentially meet the um, requirements of providing meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals using a tagline, you, you still may want to do so. Uh, next slide, please, Teresa. So I'm going to just discuss um, the relationship between the 2020 rule to the Supreme Court decision that Teresa covered in, in depth. So as Teresa said, in Bostick v. Clayton County, the Supreme Court held that Title VII protects gender identity and sexual orientation is connected to sex. The Section 1557 prohibition and the 2020 rule implementing Section 1557 against discrimination on the basis of sex reference Title IX. They do not reference Title VII. In Bostick, the court has a line that discusses what rules it applies to. And Justice Gorsuch limited the Bostick decision to Title VII um, and essentially specifically said it didn't apply outside of the context of, of Title VII. And the dissent noted, noted that as well. Where that gets us is on the basis of sex under Title IX does not include sexual orientation and gender identity. For, so for purposes of 1557, sex does not include sexual orientation and gender identity, if, at least right now. Um, if that changes, um, we'll see. I, I have a feeling that things are, are probably going to come down the line on, on Title IX and 1557 um, as well, but uh, unsure. Uh, next slide, please, Teresa. So this was in the news as well. When the 2020 rule was enacted by President Trump's administration, Governor Cuomo issued a statement um, essentially saying that regardless of what the federal law says, New York has its own laws. So New York State implemented some protections prior to the issuance of the 2020 final rule. Um, and this applies to entities and coverage subject to New York law. Generally speaking, this is going to be insured plans in New York State. Uh, Self-insured plans generally would not be subject to, to New York State uh, requirements. And some of the protections that New York State provides that have, that have been covered are Hospitals were required to update their statements of patient rights to prohibit discrimination against transgender patients and to affirmatively inform patients of their rights. Um, there was also uh, regulations issued by the New York State Department of Human Rights in 2016 that clarified that the human rights law protects transgender New Yorkers from discrimination because sex discrimination includes gender identity discrimination. This relates to the gender topics that Teresa covered before. Uh, there was also regulations issued by the New York State Department of Financial Services that ex expanded the scope of anti-discrimination protections for transgender individuals that were seeking access to health insurance. 
um, and even broader than the Affordable Care Act protections. New York prohibits discrimination in the administration of large group policies. That was not the case under the Affordable Care Act, but it is the case in New York. Uh, next slide, please, Teresa. And finally, uh, in 2017, the New York Department of Financial Services issued regulations that ensured the full scope of the Affordable Care Act's anti-discrimination protections were preserved and protected in New York, regardless of federal action. And also there was a reminder issued that the New York uh, human rights law applies to hospitals and prohibits discrimination on the basis of, of gender identity. Um, that, that's all I have, so I can turn it back to Teresa if she has any questions she'd like to answer. Okay, thanks DJ, that was great. I do have a couple questions I'd like to answer. The first one I got was, how are we supposed to know uh, which gender identity our employees identify with if we can't ask them and they don't tell us? And the answer there uh, is you can't. So if an employee doesn't tell you their correct gender identity, uh, you can't get in quote unquote legal trouble for not knowing it. Uh, the obligation, it has to do with the way Title VII and the New York State Human Rights Law claims look when they go through the courts or through the administrative process, but generally speaking, if an employer doesn't know um, that they are taking a discriminatory action or isn't aware that a discriminatory action has taken place, um, then that is going to be a defense to a Title VII or a New York human rights claim. What we're more concerned about is when an employee says, and, and often says repeatedly, I mean, every trans or uh, non-binary or gender non-conforming person I've ever met are usually very patient uh, with their correct gender identity and their correct pronouns. So what we're really concerned about is when the employer is told what those are and the employer does not use them. That's what, or, and doesn't uh, enforce the coworkers using them either. That's where we get into uh, the legal issues with Title VII and with the New York State, New York City human rights laws. The majority of the other questions I got, I think DJ actually answered a few of them, um, but the majority of other questions have to do with the slides. Uh, for those of you that weren't on the beginning and heard Kathy, she will be sending a copy of the presentation slides to you either later this afternoon or sometime tomorrow morning. Um, if you have questions uh, about anything that you've heard today, this topic I'm very passionate about, I enjoy speaking about, I know DJ feels the same. We thank you for your time and attention and please feel free to contact either of us or any bond attorney with whom you are in regular contact if you have additional questions. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you and have a wonderful week. Thank you, everyone.